And our Father and our God, we thank you again for the open door into your presence. We thank you, Father, that as we live day by day and as we breathe, we have that open door available to us at any time, any place, in any and all circumstances. And we cannot thank you enough, our Father, that you are there. You are always available to hear our request, to meet us in our crisis, to undertake for our pressing need. And we thank you, Father, for your direction and guidance that comes down from heaven. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful way that you have guided us this past week. We thank you, you've kept us safe. You have kept us up on our roads with so many accidents and incidents of injury and death. We thank you, Father, for keeping us employed that we might be able to look up after our families and our households and meet our obligations. We thank you for health and strength, our Father, to carry on for you day by day, that we might not only look after ourselves, but be able to help others and to aid them in their hour of need as well. We praise you, Father, for the great privilege of living in this marvelous land of Canada. And as we think of our country, we think of our government, and we continue to pray as Romans 13 would encourage us and instruct us. We pray, our Father, for our Prime Minister and his cabinet. We pray for those in Ottawa who are constantly engaged in making decisions that affect us all in our daily living. And we pray for wisdom, our Father, for these people. We pray, Father, that you would give them a heart that we might constantly, in all of our goings and comings, our discussions, our releases of news to the press at large, that which we would publicize for all of our citizenry, that you would indeed, our Father, keep us mindful that we are indebted to you for wisdom and blessing in the founding of this nation, the development of this country, the growth of this people, and for the fullness of provision and abundance that we enjoy here. Lord, we pray that we may never lose our vision of what was the beginning of our nation and the blessing and growth of our nation that has brought us to such a time of plenty, such a time of liberty and freedom. And yet, our Father, we realize that as government continues that more and more of our free liberty is being bounded and hindered and constrained on all sides. And we pray, Father, that we may have a heart that follows your creative purpose, that within our country and with our gifts and opportunities and uh, such great abundance that you would help us to be free to develop our gifts and abilities and to make our contribution that our country may continue to be blessed of you. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done in the past, but do help us to protect that which we enjoy. We pray, our Father, that you would continue to undertake for our world and we pray, Father, for those who are underprivileged, those who are without the necessities of life today because of storms and fires and warfare and uh, political upset in their own country where they have had to flee in order to survive. And we pray for these people, not only physically, but we pray for them spiritually, for it is out of great need that all of us awaken our need of a savior jesus christ when we come to that place where we cannot help ourselves we do not see anything by way of aid on the horizon we cry out to you and we come to the lord jesus and as we come to him we find not only salvation we find health and strength and the abundance of a great life 
of service and ministry to others. We pray, our Father, for our sick. We do thank you for each and every life that has been with us for, in many cases, for years. And we thank you for them in their place of treatment in hospital, in nursing home, those who are being cared for in the homes of their family. And Lord, we pray that you would speed health and care and healing to these people, that you would raise them up to full usefulness for you again, that we may rejoice together. And then our Father, we, we thank you for new life. We thank you for the birth of every child. And we thank you for the birth of dear Ellis today. Thank you, Father, the uh, great privilege that this young lad has as he begins to develop and grow. We thank you for his Christian home, for his parents who have committed their lives to you, that he will be loved, he will be guarded, he will be guided by you. And we pray, our Father, that this would be a constant inspiration to all of us concerning our responsibilities of not killing our children, but raising them up in the truth and in the nurture and admonition of your word. Lord, take this life and use it mightily for you as it would develop and grow all for your honor. We thank you, Father, for the blessings of life. Thank you for the needs that are before us in our own hearts and in our own lives. We pray that these needs may be met because you are a God of miracle. And often it is a need that draws us very close to yourself. We are helpless. We are unable to address that crisis in our own life. So we cry out to you. And then our Father, when we come, in all of our brokenness and our lack of supply. You have mercy upon us. You draw us to yourself. You love us and you care for us. And you bring us into the fullness of fellowship and usefulness for you. Bless us, Lord, as a church. Thank you for all that you are doing. Continue to bless and move as we would seek to honor you together in the days to come that many, many souls may come to Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, it is a great question and people uh, would be uh, actually verified or justified in asking the question. And, and the question is a simple one, but it is a profound question. And that is, what are you living for? What is your life really all about? Well, I, I work a job, I do this, I do that, and so on and, and whatnot. And uh, I certainly uh, are, as the people of God, we want to be praising God. We want to be thanking God. And it's that positive prayer approach where we thank God that opens up a whole vista of experience to us. We are always occupied with problems and difficulties and the negative issues in life to the point where we're trying to solve, we're trying to answer, we're trying to come up with whatever is required of us. But when we are people who are uh, anxious and eager uh, to know and to do what God would have us to profit from his book and his wisdom, we understand that it is growth, it is development in an overall goal that he has for each of us. And uh, I thought of that and I add uh, a word of appreciation on behalf of Betty Ann. She had her surgery last Monday and uh, it was an incredible time. The, the, whole, the whole movement of all of those events. She, of course, uh, the week before had gone to Frankfurt, Germany for the biggest book fair in the world. That's her business, uh, marketing books to any country in the world. And uh, as she was there with thousands and thousands of people uh, visiting her clients and so on, she was in very bad shape. She had a very bad hip and the hip needed to be replaced. And she had checked with a surgeon. The surgeon said, no. He said, do not have the surgery beforehand. You uh, get on an airplane and you sit for what, seven hours or whatever to get over and you are likely to develop blood clots and that is not good. 
blood clots can take you out. So uh, I don't know what your life is like or your responsibilities are, but you, if you're gonna have surgery, have it when you come back. So that's exactly what she did. She went to Frankfurt, Germany. She struggled through with all this pain and all of this and got all her work done, met the people she was supposed to meet, got on a plane, came back, had a couple of days and then went in and had her surgery. Would you believe that uh, actually she went and she was first surgery of the day last Monday. Uh, she's not even a week uh, in, in recovery as of this hour, uh, but uh, she had the surgery and it was a marvelous, marvelous success. Uh, actually, the surgeon was there. It was, uh, they, she had wonderful uh, people, uh, 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 a nurse who looked after her, 35 years experience in, uh, <laughs> In looking after people, shared with her, and she was uh, just marvelously cared for. And uh, as uh, she had the surgery, it was over in about 45 minutes or so, then she recovers in uh, maybe an hour and a half or two. And guess what? They have her up walking up and down the halls right after the surgery. She's doing steps on the day of the surgery. <laughs> and I could not believe that having had hip surgery myself uh, over 10 years ago and all of the <laughs> way they do it today and so on. And uh, as a result, she uh, went, walked out of the hospital that very afternoon, went home, had a nurse come in the next day and a nurse has been in her home each day and she is progressing wonderfully well. He said, you're gonna be bored you know, <laughs> with this whole thing. So we, she said, Dad, be sure and thank the people for praying because prayer does do wonderful things and gets us through. And all of this, because uh, this is what uh, our life is. What are we living for? What am I trying to do with my life? Well, the overall uh, goal or answer would be that we want to please God and we want to please God by doing the will of God and the first thing is to trust Christ as Savior. And then we have the shepherd who directs us. We have the power that we need. We have all that God can do in and our, through our lives to fit us out for that particular area of ministry he has for us. And uh, we fit. We find our place. We grow in the place. And we make our contribution. And uh, we move on in the course of life. And that is what we find here in the book of the Acts, because we find the birth of the church, the growth of the church, but we find individuals who really learned to give God the glory, do his will, serve him accordingly. And we have been looking at the life of the Apostle Paul as of late, and all of the gifting that God had given him, and the change that came, of course, as the enemy of Christ, the persecutor, the murderer of Christians, and uh, the, the uh, absolute uh, worst individual that could encounter any believer because the only uh, good person in his time of unbelief was a dead Christian. And he uh, consented unto the death of the first martyr, Stephen, as we read in the seventh chapter of this book. So the Apostle Paul here is now uh, working through the uh, final days of his ministry. And uh, as he serves and as he ministers here, he is uh, really on the defense because uh, he's in the minority. Uh, this is a brand new faith. He's presenting a, a brand new hero spiritually, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came into this world to suffer and die, to take away our sins and give us a brand new birth in the family of God. This is what he's presented. This is a minority group. It's just getting started. And he comes from a long-standing, centuries-old faith, Judaism, his faith in Moses and the law, essentially our Old Testament, which was all preparation and part of God's great plan of salvation. Because the Old Testament and the law really is to show us that no matter how good you think you are, you are not good enough in the eyes of God to be righteous and to be go uh, uh, share heaven in his family. But we all are sinners lost and undone, and we need a Savior. Christ became that Savior. 
And he, the Son of God, laid down his life, shed his blood, and rose again the third day for our justification. So that is the great ministry of the Apostle Paul. The great purpose and joy of his life was sharing this wonderful way that you can, in any background, any circumstance, the worst of the worst, you can be changed, you can be altered, you can be clean, you can become a child of God and serve him faithfully. And that has been the burden of his life as he has gone from place to place. And so as we come now where he is on the defense, and he is on the defensive because uh, people uh, of uh, his Jewish faith have said, you're a traitor. You were a rabbi, you uh, taught in synagogues, you uh, were a, a great leader of uh, Judaism, and you turned from that to this new religion, and uh, you say Jesus is not only our Savior, but our Messiah. Well, we know that we do not know, believe that he is our Messiah. We do believe there is a Messiah coming. He's yet to come. He's yet to be born. And the Jews have always had uh, a blank uh, place in their understanding with regard to the suitability of Jesus to become not only Savior of the world, but also the coming King who will set up his kingdom one day in planet Earth. And it will be a rule of righteousness that will issue into an eternal time. Now, what we have... Uh, that comes through over and over again in the life of the Apostle Paul is this passionate purpose to see that as he was blind as a religious man, that was his business, that's what he studied in his life, and he was blind to the fact that he missed it all, he was on the wrong track, he missed the value of Christ and becoming not only a believer in him but a servant of his as well. That was the great joy and thrill of his life. And so you find in these closing chapters over and over again where he's called to give his defense. What does he talk about? He talks about his conversion. He talks about the new birth. You know, you, we heard that the other day. Yeah, but this is key. If you don't get this, you don't get anything of a lasting value with regard to knowing Christ as your savior and the great overall purpose that God has for you. So this passionate purpose of the apostle Paul was, uh, was laid down in all of his closing days of ministry. So he's on trial, he's being accused, the whole world against him, and especially the, Jew, the Jews, and they have really set themselves to kill him, to assassinate him. As we read, you know, in the last days here, 40 men covenanted together, Judaism, Judaism uh, people who said, we will commit ourselves not to eat, not to sleep until Paul is dead. He's the enemy. And we cannot endorse anything that he represents. So he stood in the face of all of this. And of course, the center of all this opposition was in Jerusalem. So as he's out there, you know, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, he says, well, you know what? They're having Passover in Jerusalem. I've got to go back because I do believe in Passover. Passover is part of God's plan of salvation, preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus was our Passover lamb. And I have got to go back. No, no, Paul. And you remember the warnings over and over and over on the part of Christian people. Do not go, they will kill you. You're more valuable to us alive than to be a dead martyr. And, and he, he faced this over and over and, and he wrestled with God about it. And he said, I must, I must go back to Jerusalem. So that's where he wound up is in Jerusalem. And when he went into Jerusalem, he hadn't been around, but his fame had spread. They were waiting for him. They're waiting to kill him. And uh, as he uh, uh, met with the church, and at that time, the half-brother of our Lord, James, was the pastor of the church 
in Jerusalem. And he met with him. He met with the church and Christians. They all Christians welcomed him. They were glad to have him here, but they feared for his life. And as the apostle Paul stood to uh, give uh, testimony, he said, uh, I've got to do this. This is what God has for me. Well, we don't understand that. But uh, anyway, it, we support you in uh, your leading uh, of God in your life. So uh, we think about what was so uh, uh, so instructive, so essential, uh, what was the motive, the driving force in his life that caused him to have this passion to see other people come to know Christ as Savior. Uh, you, can, you can teach the Word of God to believers. You can help other people with a Christian uh, practical way. You, you get housing for them, feed them. You look after their health needs. You do all kinds of things to aid. But he said, no, they've got to know Christ. They've got to know Christ. And I stand to present the gospel in that particular way. And I think there were really two things. And, and this is true, I think, with uh, anybody who has lived uh, any measure of life, say, into, uh, well, certainly adolescence and in the early days and the longer you live, of course, the more mistakes you make. And where people who come to Christ late in life, uh, the great... Uh, 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 tragedy as they look back is all those years I spent on myself and it was fruitless it was endless it was wasted and uh, there was a great sense I think with Paul I was preaching and I was standing for the law which really kept saying over and over again everybody's lost and undone they need a savior but the savior was never presented and I just, you gotta live by the law, keep the law, do the law. Nobody can keep the law completely without God's help and without a new birth. And uh, as this, the apostle Paul ministered this purpose in his life, he was doing all the wrong things over and over again to the point where he even consented to the death of, of Stephen, a great, great servant of God, humble, loving, uh, transparent and here he stood by while he not, not only encouraged but assented to the stoning of Stephen to death a servant of God that's all he was guilty of was loving and serving God and honoring him I think the thing that drove him to this great passion in his life was a sense of guilt and we all know if you've lived any length of time in your life and you've uh, been responsible for some things that weren't all that holy or all that encouraging or helpful to other people, you look back and you think as you come to Christ and you see the difference now, how could I ever have done that? How could I ever have conducted myself in that fashion? How could I ever have lied, misrepresented, cheated, whatever it may be? I've broken the Ten Commandments right down, you know, from beginning to end in one way or another, if not in actual action, in thought. And that's all sin. How could I do that? Now that I see that it is sin that brought Christ to the cross and he died to save me from my sin, that I might live a life that is honoring to God. And then I can start keeping the law of God by his strength and by his health. And the great truth is, you know, that there is uh, no individual for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. There's total forgiveness for any and everything that we have done in the past. Now, God doesn't change history, but he does change the person. And we don't do the things that we used to do. We don't think the way we thought. We don't speak the way we thought, uh, speak. We don't uh, conduct ourselves with self-interest in mind. We're living for other people. We're living according to the uh, record of God. And uh, from time to time, Satan will get into this with you. And in a low time, he'll say, you think you're so, you're so hot as a Christian. You're so good as a Christian. Remember when and our answer is, you know, I, I have faint recollection of that, 
but it's under the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. He took our payment. He took our judgment, and we are free. He loved us that much. So when we understand that, then we can move on. But Satan is always raising the past. He's convicting us of things that have been cared for and dealt with with God. They're gone forever. Uh, this sense of guilt, this sense of failure. And uh, we know that even as Christians, you know, we do things that uh, are questionable and, and outright wrong. Or we are misled or we make bad judgments or give bad advice or whatever it may be. But as God's children, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that the disobedience, the lack of wisdom, the, the, the quick answer without thinking through, the, the, the light flippant reply, whatever it may mean, would be something that would be, uh, well, yeah, it happened and so on, but Lord, forgive me. I should have been more attentive. I should have been more uh, tuned in. I should have been more aware. So there is forgiveness for the worst of sins in our life. And as the children of God, that was all paid for when Jesus died. He took care of all our sins, past and present and future. I mean, to think, who, is, who can say, even as a Christian, I live just like Jesus lived, absolutely spotless, squeaky clean in my relationship with Almighty God. We all fail because we're in the flesh. We have an old nature. And from time to time, we give in to the old nature or we're weariness or whatever it may be. We, we lose it and so on. The other thing, uh, that I think motivated the Apostle Paul with regard to this passionate purpose to see other people come to Christ. I got to redeem the time. I spent all those years doing the devil's work, doing uh, work uh, for my own advancement and my own uh, uh, objective and goal in life, but it was so, so, so far removed from what God wanted me to be and do. I, I am a person who understanding the forgiveness of God and I can go into his presence at any time. That's a wonderful thing. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, what, what was the great demonstration of freedom and openness that we have into the presence of God as believers when he breathed his last, that temple veil which was like three feet thick, was ripped in two and the Holy of Holies was open to every believer to come into the presence of God and know forgiveness and fellowship. And that was made possible because Jesus paid the price and died. Only the high priest went in once a year on the Day of Atonement. But here, we have access into the very presence of God and say, God, forgive me. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I sincerely, you know, should have handled it better. I should have done uh, differently in my life. But, and we are forgiven. We are forgiven. If we confess, he forgives. And I think that burden of the guilt of sin coupled with the gratitude of the completeness of God's forgiveness in our life that we never have to beat ourselves up for what we have done in the past. Now, we can be forgiven with God, but we still have accountability and responsibility for the way we live down here. And we can't break the law of the land and ask God to forgive us and we are forgiven of the, <laughs> of, uh, the law of the land. No, we have, that's all part of uh, our life and the reality of what the Christian life is meant to be. That we are forgiven of God and our relationship with him, we're still his child. But before the law of the land, we have to pay our dues. We are not an exceptional individual. We are people, if we have 
done anything that has broken the law, we present our case, we pay our, our a penalty, and we are forgiven, and uh, then we go on and live. So that, I think, coupled mo moved the Apostle Paul to this passionate desire to see people come to know the Lord, because he knew what it meant in his own life. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> that you never know today, but you know, uh, anyone who has willfully taken the life of someone else, and you realize the severity of that. And it was in the heat of passion or anger or, or something. You were really out of it. You, were, you had lost it. And then you, you, you think back upon it. And I, I was guilty of that. I, and, and you're thinking now in a sane and in a sensible, and as a believer even, how could I ever have done that? There's forgiveness, there's cleansing. But if we are guilty, we pay the penalty for whatever the responsibility may be for contributing to the death of another individual. So that is, comes through loud and clear. And when we find the, uh, the Apostle Paul here called on various occasions, and in at least three occasions, he gives his presentation, what he was doing, what he was about, how he was fulfilling the will of God. He always mentions his conversion experience. He always talks about the day on the Damascus Road when he was stricken down, he fell down in that bright sunshine and it was a light that shone from heaven brighter than the sun itself. And he fell down and he knew exactly what was happening. God was talking to him and dealing with him. In an, out, in, in an unusual way, an outstanding fashion. Everybody isn't converted like, the, uh, like Saul of Tarsus, but he was converted because of God in his great uh, love and forgiveness. He was able to be forgiven and he ra was raised up blind, blind as a bat. He couldn't see a thing. And, but God always has, and this is where we are available there was a fellow whose name was Ananias, you remember. It's all there in, in, the, in the, uh, the story of his conversion, and he tells it over and over again. This man was there to help him, and here he said, Paul, it's okay. You can't see, I'll guide you. And so he knew where he was to go, and God was caring for him and dealing with him and giving him some instruction and so on as a brand new baby Christian. And the Apostle Paul was a fast, fast growth specimen. And he began to grow and so on, and he's soon out sharing the gospel with people. Paul's passionate purpose in winning people to the Lord Jesus. And it's like, if I don't do it, who else will? Who can I ex expect to come along and do the job? So he talked to everybody, and we find that he, in his own experience, as it's played out for us, in addition to his own confession here, we understand what happened. We understand that he said, I've got to go back to Jerusalem. Paul, if you go back, they're gonna kill you. I'll leave that to God, but I've gotta go back, and I've gotta to get together with the church. I've gotta let the people of, uh, uh, of, of Judaism. No, I'm not against Moses. Moses was inspired of God to give us the law, to give us the need for our salvation. And he had a place to a play. And I'm going to follow the law because he determined to what? Make a vow in his life. And to make a vow under the law of Moses was a decision that was personal. And it could be where you've been, you know, reading the word of God, you've been growing as a believer, and you come to the place where you say, you know, it, it's time for me to take a step up, to make a better, a higher commitment, a more detailed commitment of my life to the Lord. And that's a vow you make. And you know that you never make a vow lightly. When you promise before God, you keep the promise. God being your strength and your helper. And I need to do that. And that's a personal thing. And he goes back to Jerusalem and there are four other men that are ready to make vows. They're personal vows. 
And uh, the church says, well, look, Paul, you know, Judaism is accusing you of, 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 uh, of uh, negating everything that the law requires. Here, you're going to demonstrate, no, no, I believe the law. The law has its place, but I am going to support the law and carry out the law because I'm going to make a vow to God. He goes up to the temple to make a vow and they are waiting for him. And they drag him out of the temple. They lock the door and they start beating him. They're ready to kill him right on, on the spot. And as this develops it, and then pretty soon someone says, get the police. Well, who are the police? Well, we find there's a man named Lysias who was uh, really a Roman soldier. Now remember, Israel was under the control of the Roman Empire. So the police force were Roman soldiers. And they came in and they looked after it. Lysias was like the chief of police for Jerusalem. And uh, so when they called, they said, look, is it, you got to do something. Okay, we get, the, we get the troops out there. They settled things down and they got a hold of Paul. And they said, well, here, here's the fellow that's caused all the trouble. That's what the Jews said. Okay, then we'll take care of him. And so if he's uh, uh, just one of these fellows that goes around and stirs up riots and is really uh, disturbing the peace, we'll teach him a lesson. And we'll have him taken uh, and he will be stripped to the waist and he will be beaten with a cat of nine tails. And that'll be a taste of the pain. And then after that, we're going to interrogate him. In other words, you know, and Paul was not a young man. And nobody needs to be beaten with a cat of nine tails that has, at the end of the leather strips, pieces of metal and glass and so on fixed into the work to rip the, the back of his flesh, the flesh off his back and, to, and cause all kinds of pain and so on, not only during the flogging, but afterward in the healing process and so on. And so we'll, we'll teach him and, and uh, we'll, we'll soften him up. And then we will have another time with him and say, okay, now are you ready to really be honest with you? What were you doing? Why were you doing this? And so on and so on. And if not, we'll flog you again. And in the cor course of this, the chief of, uh, uh, of the police at that time, which was a Roman soldier in charge of all law and order in the city of Jerusalem, he says uh, to the centurion, okay, you go and talk to this fella and tell him we're ready to flog him again. We want to question him. So they, they go out and, they, and the fella is uh, getting him ready and by, uh, tying up his hands and so on. And so he can't resist. And, and Paul says, uh, are you sure this is legally right? Well, what do you mean? Is it legally right? He said, can you do this to a Roman citizen? A Roman citizen? You mean you're a Roman citizen? Yes, I am. I'm a Roman citizen. And there was a law for centuries with regard to Roman citizens. You could not do any, inflict any punishment of the law against a Roman citizen without a proper trial in which that person is proved beyond a shadow of a doubt guilty. Then you may minister the correction or the punishment that was due to the crime. And when the centurion heard this, he goes back to the chief and he says, you know, this, this fellow says he's a Roman citizen. We can't do that. If we were to, if we were to flog him, they would kill us. We, they, we are to protect Roman citizens. We did, just don't abuse that privilege and so on. So the chief of police says, well, uh, let's, uh, let's talk with this fellow. And so they have him in and, uh, and they, they talk with him and uh, the uh, chief of police says, how did you get your Roman citizenship? He said, I got my, uh, my Roman citizenship, Paul speaking. I was born free. I was born a Roman citizen in, in an outstanding city known for its religious teaching, its honorable status. I was born in Tarsus and I became a rabbi and I was born with all the privileges of Rome behind me as a citizen. Oh, he said, I can't believe that. And the, and the captain of the guard, the chief of police in this case, 
He said, you know, I was not born free and it cost me a lot of money to buy my position into the family of Roman citizenry. I am privileged as a Roman citizen. I wouldn't be in the army if I wasn't a Roman citizen to fight and to protect Rome. But he said, we need, we need to talk. And so with the opening and the honesty that went on between these two people, I think really it was Claudius Lysias, the chief of the police, the Roman soldier who was responsible for law and order in the city of Jerusalem, who was used of God to protect Paul, to help him on every side during this time because he knew what was right, he knew what was wrong, and he knew that the Jews certainly had uh, a vengeance uh, uh, attack against him. So in their dealings with him, he is the fellow who is constantly saying, you know, now uh, what right do you have? And he lines up the people and Paul is put on trial. And we will see as we go through those people one after another how Paul was able to witness to them. He always, it's my salvation. What God did for me in saving me, he can do for you. That was his, is always in anything he had to say. He said this when uh, he stood before the philosophers in, in Greece, in Athens. When he went up on Mars Hill, let me tell you about the unknown God. This is the God who loves you, who forgives you, who saves you. And uh, so the Apostle Paul was constantly sharing that message uh, because of his own guilt of the past, his gratitude to God for forgiving him, wiping the slate clean, calling him into his work. And now he is presenting this because he's the object of uh, judgment by uh, on uh, behalf of uh, Judaism at large and uh, so unfolds here a whole series of uh, situations but it all involves people people in different walks of life and what to me is part of God's marvelous guidance and direction through this whole thing is Paul was given to understand what was God doing in your life? What did he plant in your, whole, your heart? You know, long haul. Like, you're going to be a witness for me. You're going to be here. You're going to be there. But where do you want to go? He said, I want to go first when I was out in the Mediterranean world to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Secondly, I must go where? To Rome. To Rome. And I believe it was Paul, uh, either, I think God revealed this to Paul. And Paul didn't have a lot of money. He wasn't, uh, you know, able to just hop a ship and, and so on. Uh, he, he just lived uh, from one day to the next. Uh, but as Paul thought about this, God said, you know, as you pass through the system of justice to Rome, they will pay your way all the way to Rome because you are not going to be satisfied as a Roman citizen to take local justice or judgment. And if you follow the Jews, they'll kill you and that's the end of it. But if there is uh, in the justice of Rome a, a way in which you might be spared your life, then you would go from this level of justice to the next level and so we have these individuals who are involved in a judgment. Uh, king Agrippa, and he was king, he was a grandson of Herod the Great, and he had control over some territories and cities. And so he was uh, a, a king, and uh, he came to play, but he was part of Rome and so on. And all these people said, all right, we will let you go to the next level, to the next level. And the ultimate level was, Paul, what are you going to do now? You're going to settle for the judgment here? He said, no, I'm going to a higher rate of uh, a level of appeal. I am going all the way to Caesar. 
to Caesar. And Paul understood that the Roman Empire, because he was a charged criminal, would take him completely through the justice system all the way to the ruler of the Roman Empire himself to hear his case and make a judgment. How God works in unusual ways. And that's why he was so adamant. So adamant, no, I, I, I have a right. I'm a Roman citizen. You have not proven me guilty. You have no evidence and I go to the next level. I appeal, I appeal, I appeal until I get to Caesar. And they said, it's just like when he was going to, to Jerusalem. If, they go, if you go to Jerusalem, they'll kill you on sight. They'll, they'll put you to death. He said, look, it doesn't matter whether I live or die. It's what I do to honor the Lord and let people know they can be saved by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so Paul went all the way to Rome. And when he presented his case in Rome, they beheaded him. He was guilty. But he accomplished the ministry of witnessing to small and great. I think a, a fellow who was tremendously impacted by the testimony of Paul was a centurion charge over a hundred soldiers and he and so when the chief said do this do that he just did it but when he found out that this was this uh, not according to the law he goes back to the chief he calls the chief's attention the chief makes some adjustments and so on so it uh, it ultimately is climbing the ladder of justice to the highest of courts of appeal caesar but caesar will hear the gospel with all of these other people. What commitment, what commitment. He was absolutely committed. I will get this job done wherever and however I possibly can to all who were listening. And the great ministry for us is look every day for opportunities to do what Paul did, share the message of salvation with people. And especially in times of trouble and pain, because this offers unusual doors of opening where you can share. And then you count upon God as your presence. You remember it was God who spoke to Paul and said, Paul, you've had a rough time, but I'm going to stand with you and I'll be with you all the way. So it is a lesson to us in our time. Canada is no longer a Christian nation. You know that. All that has been done in days gone by, by way of honoring the word of God, by way of prayer in public places, in times of meeting, of uh, public assembly, prayer, 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 teaching a Bible in the schools, all of these things, it's all gone now. It's all gone. And if we are to do our part, we've got to stand and say, we've got to listen to God. Have you, do you know God has spoken? We need to get the message out there. And, it's be, and we lost the ground because we quit. We quit in church. Who goes to church today? Church, church is just dropped off. You don't have anything except popular uh, appeal kind of services that really are man-made philosophy and, and self-help and and uh, pep talk kind of things, not the word of God, not the word of God. But we quit and we need to rally and we need to get out there and say the word of God says, Jesus said, quote him, this is what God has for us if we believe. So we keep on keeping on because God is the one to whom we will give a report and he will judge our ultimate usefulness for him. Well, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for these marvelous, marvelous times that we have read about in the life of the Apostle Paul and the early Christians. And Lord, it was, it was just a, it was a day by day existence kind of thing. They weren't you know, all wealthy people. There was uh, some money around, but the money and the uh, privileges that these people who were blessed had all became part and parcel of churches. Homes became the first churches. Land became the first gathering places for meetings. Anything that people had was turned into usefulness 
for the advancement of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's uh, like Paul said, it's do or die. You know, I've got to do it. I've got to go there. I'm not thinking about my own welfare. If I die, I go and be with the Lord. If I live, I carry on a little while longer. So Lord, we pray that we will catch some of the fire of the early church that started from nothing and became a ministry that impacted our whole world. And we ask, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful because Jesus is coming back. And as he, we look forward to his return, whenever that may be, we pray that we would be able to stand before you and say, Lord, you know my life. Forgive me for my failures, but you know I've been learning and I've been working and I've been busy and I want others to share this marvelous privilege of going to heaven and being with you and serving you forever. So Lord, we commit ourselves afresh with the spirit of the Apostle Paul. Fearless, you are our strength, you are our shield. You give us the sword of the spirit. You are ready to go to battle for us and we could be victorious in our time. So bless us to that end in Jesus' precious name, amen.